So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know or who are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We're really excited today. We've got six classes from across North America joining us live. Uh, one more might be coming in, and quite a few are watching online. So it's a really nice, uh, wide hangout today. So first, we've got Miss Deshane's class, grade threes in Bristol, Ooh. Connecticut. Uh, we've got Miss Eagles grade fives in San Antonio and Texas. Yay! Hey, we've got Miss Rouch's grade ones in Winnipeg, Manitoba. The first time we've ever had them. Hi, guys. We've got Miss Olervides, uh, grade fours in San Antonio, Texas, as well. Hey, we've got Miss Eggert's grade ones in Bloomingdale, Illinois. Hi. Hi. And last but not least, we've got Miss Langer's grade three fours in Coburg, Ontario. Hi, Miss Langer. All right, they're in the back. We'll figure out the mic later. We'll make it work. All right, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. We are joined live in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario by Entomica. So since 2014, they have made it their mission to showcase that bugs are not something to be feared and they're scary, but they are a wide and wonderful world of amazing animals. Uh, they've done numerous hangouts with them before. We're thrilled to have them back. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Entomica. No, no problem. Thanks for having us, Jesse. Cool. Is it on me? Not yeah, sure. Okay, Jesse, can you see me or can you see uh I can see your colleague. There you oh. are. I gotta figure out how to flip it. Yeah. There we go. See all the videos that you're doing. Alright, welcome everyone. Welcome to Entomica. Thanks for joining in today. And uh, my name is Michael. I'll be your bug wrangler today, and we're gonna take a tour. So I know not all of you guys can make it to Sault Ste. Marie to visit our facility here, but we'd like to give you a, a little taste of uh, some of what we have. And uh, shout out to, to Coburg and all the other classics. So first thing we have today, guys, Ooh. is <laughs> a little flighty today. Everyone know what it is? This is a praying mantis. So this particular mantis is a giant Malaysian deadleaf mantis. So this guy here, as you can see, isn't camouflaging like a lot of the praying mantises we have in North America that would be uh, like a bright green color and would camouflage like a nice green leaf. This guy is a dead leaf. So he would hide on the forest floor and he would ambush his prey. And his prey could be anything that he could, uh, he could tackle here. He does have wings, as you can see. He's not much of a flyer, but he can glide pretty well, yeah. <laughs> Helps him break his fall. So here at Entomica, we feed him mostly crickets um, and insects we'd catch outside. So little grasshoppers, small katydids and the like. And uh, yeah, this girl just laid a new fika. A new fika is, <laughs> is a mantid's egg sac. So I'll see if we can show you this egg sac in here. So if all goes well, guys, this egg sac uh, will hatch maybe somewhere between 100 and 200 praying mantis babies. And then it'll be our job to, uh, to keep them alive into adulthood and uh, keep this bug rearing cycle alive. So this mantid is one of uh, the only predator insects that we have here at Entomica. And I believe it's the only one we'll be looking at today. But it's really friendly. We keep it really well fed and it's never bit anyone. Including Jacob. Is that right, Jacob? That's right. All right. So we're going to put this guy back. You can see his legs there. Perfect for grabbing. Really good. <laughs> okay. And we'll lock that guy back up for now. So the next thing we have to show you guys is a giant African land snail. So this is the longest living uh, guy that we have here at Entomica. He'll live 10 or 15 years if we, uh, if we keep him well. 
Um, and all he really needs is a, a source of calcium. And he's a, got a pretty voracious appetite. So he, he'll eat just about anything we feed him. Uh, really loves lettuce, any kind of fruits and vegetables. And we're going to see if we can get him to come out and take a look at us here. So he's poking out one eye. He's coming out really, uh, really gingerly just to, just to see what's going on. And so, yeah, you can see his eyes up top that he's able to inflate and deflate at will. His palps down low, so these are like his external tongues that he can use to taste his food before he starts ingesting it. And now he's feeling a little more comfortable and he's coming out a little, a little bit more. Um, so all these lines on his shell, guys, are, are different layers of shell. He keeps this one shell his entire life. And he just keeps adding layers to it as he grows. And so right here on the edge would be the newest layer of shell. It's still really soft. It hasn't dried and hardened yet, like the rest of the shell. It's rock hard. So like I said, these are originally from Africa. As some of you know, they're now invasive in uh, eastern and southern parts of the United States, especially Florida. They've become what's known as an invasive species. So they don't have natural predators here to keep their population under control. And because of how quickly they breed and how much they eat, they're actually having a, a really devastating impact on the environment. So uh, these are uh, under the top 100 invasive species in North America, and they've recently come to Canada as well. So of everything we have here today that you'll see, this is the most dangerous. It's the only one we never take outside the building, uh, just for that threat of it possibly being able to uh, make a go of things outside and have a negative impact on our environment. If you were to feel him, he's really slimy. <laughs> and just for comparison, I have a, a little snail from outside. That's about as big as our snails get here naturally. Okay. And Jesse, feel free to interrupt for uh, Q and A's as you please, as always. All right. In this display over here, guys, I have a collection of stick insects or phasmids. So these Rewardi stick insects come from Thailand, and you'll find sticks stick insects all over the world, guys. We have uh, one type here in Ontario called the Northern Walking Stick. It hasn't quite made its way to uh, Sault Ste. Marie yet, but with the changing climate, it is getting close. They are make, migrating more north. And they all have a very similar body structure. They're just trying to camouflage like particular sticks or branches in the environment in which they live. So again, this one comes from Thailand. They're all herbivores. They really just eat leaves. Um, and their, their only defense really is their excellent camouflage. So he can't bite me. He can't hurt me in any way. He's got a very gentle grip. But yeah, you can see how his segments um, help him camouflage a little bit better. He does have some tiny, tiny wings, not for flying, but for warning. Oh, really hard to see these guys. So they're bright red. Red's a warning color in the insect world, guys. Kind of means uh, maybe I'm dangerous or I'm venomous. And you should leave me alone. And that's what he's making use of here. Might that be color best red. to give him a little swing to get them open. Yeah, we could try that. So sometimes if he gets the sense that he's falling, guys, he will put his wings up, but he's not wanting to right now. So we'll put him back. Let him take a break. And we'll get one of his friends here, who is a stick who's camouflaging more like a little piece of bamboo. So again, these stick insects will take colors and shapes appropriate to uh, the trees in their environment. So being green, he likely comes from a more uh, tropical area of the world, where you're more likely to see green branches throughout the year. So this guy's doing like a little bit of a wind dance right now to simulate the movement uh, you might see in nature if he was on a branch. 
outside. So cool. And you'll notice he's missing just a little piece of his leg here. Uh, this happens naturally all the time, guys. Luckily, these stick insects have the ability to regenerate their limbs. So they go through a process of molting as they grow, which is essentially uh, shedding their skin to grow larger. And as they do so, they'll grow back their limbs if they've lost any. It's kind of like a superpower. <laughs> it's a pretty good superpower to have. And pretty rare in the animal world. I think only otherwise some, uh, some lizards have this ability. All right, this is our favorite here in Atomica, guys. Not an insect, but a tarantula. So this is Rosie. She is our Chilean rose tarantula. We've had her now for almost four years. She's full grown. And she's just really friendly because of uh, how often she's handled by people with different smells and, and tastes. She doesn't find a uh, human touch threat in any way so often you would find with um, insects and especially tarantulas in the wild they would have different defense mechanisms other than just biting uh, so she's slightly venomous guys but she has a couple other um, yeah defensive abilities that she could use to help her in the wild so she could raise up tall tall and make herself seem bigger than she is to uh, hopefully scare off some potential predators. She also has what are called articulating hairs on her abdomen here that she can fling with her feet that if they were to get into a predator's eyes or, or my eyes or my lungs, uh, they could be quite, uh, quite painful, quite annoying. And so both of those things use a lot less energy than the energy it takes to produce her venom. So she would try out those defensive measures before she would bite. Now, luckily for us, she hasn't tried any of those things on anyone here. Mm -hmm. And she's now been held by over 10,000 people. Michael, uh, she appears yes, to, Jesse. She appears to have more than eight legs. Could you tell us what the ones at the front are? Uh, so the ones in the front, guys, if you were to look at her, it almost looks like she might have 10 legs. While the two at the very front do look quite a bit look like legs, they're, they're quite a bit shorter as well, you guys will see. Uh, and these are the petty pops that have been made to do work like legs, but really they're, they're more for feeding than anything else. Uh, now, they do have the hairs that are on the other legs as well because those... Um, those hairs help so well at picking up vibration and possible danger. But if you count all the long legs, right, the true legs, there's only eight. Just like any, uh, any spider or tarantula. And where does she produce silk from? So, as we all know, spiders produce silk. Where does it come from on her? So, she produces this silk right at the back there, you guys can see. Jacob calls them, uh, calls them her butt fingers. <laughs> and so while tarantulas, they won't uh, spin a web like other spiders might to catch their food, they still have the ability to produce silk. And so she uses it here just to make a nice cozy bed for herself. Cool. But you won't find them spinning webs for the purposes of catching prey. They have all the, uh, the other hardware they need. And... So she has the eight legs, and I hear she has eight of something else as well. Yes, she has eight eyes, Jesse. Good call. So we can't see all of her eyes up top, but there are a couple you can see right here. And she needs all those eyes to be able to see uh, all the way around her because they're not of the highest quality vision. So our, our praying mantis that we just looked at has really great depth perception. It can see in 3D very well. Uh, similar to human vision, the spider is making use of multiple eyes to give it a, a better idea of what's going on. And again, it really relies on vibration and smell and taste 
uh, to determine possible threats. As far as as far as spiders and tarantulas go, the only one with the greatest eyesight that's similar to ours would be the jumping spider. Yeah, the jumping spider does need a, a depth perception to uh, make those jumps accurately. So you will find, um, yeah, that a lot of arboreal spiders have much better vision than some of the, the ground dwelling spiders. And for pretty much all the classes here, you'll see jumping spiders around your house. They're the ones that actually come and like look at you straight on, which is really fun. <laughs> all right, yeah, so we'll put Rosie back here. She really likes it in this cup here. Gives her a sense of security. So did you guys want to show us one more thing, or do you want to go to Q&A, or do you want to do it at the same time? Whatever works for you. We'll do, we'll do one more. Let's, let's do that. Perfect. So guys, looks like we have a dead insect here, unfortunately. Oh. This is a Malayan jungle nymph. And now this is funny because I just put this one out. And it seemed fine a moment ago. Let's see if we can bring it back to life. All right, so we can see that its antennae are moving. And I think if it gets comfortable here in a minute, it's going to start to move again. And so often you'll find, guys, one of the defensive measures that insects use are the ability to just act like statues, to play dead. And by not creating any motion, they're not drawing any attention to themselves for predators. So it's a really great tactic that they use, especially those that are already camouflaging like leaves. They don't want to create any unnecessary motion that's going to draw attention to themselves. So we got a couple more here. I'm going to grab as well. She's being a little moody with me today. Oh. So I don't know if you guys can hear this, but she's able to move her wings in such a way as to create a, almost like a wind sound that if you'd never heard it before, it's, it's a little bit freaky. It's a little scary. And this is another measure she uses to ward off predators. And I say she, guys, because it's, it's clear by looking at her um, that she's a female. We can see that she has this spike at the end that's an ovipositor. This is where she'll lay her eggs from. With most insects, um, the females are much larger for this reason. They have to carry around and lay all these eggs. And the males are not burdened with this responsibility. So this male here is fully grown but he's less than a quarter of the size of the female. The female's carrying around, just by luck, a juvenile Malaysian jungle nymph on her back that looks... Oh, she's giving me a good squeeze. <laughs> so yeah, we have a juvenile female here, which is about the same size as the full-grown adult male. And what looks to be a juvenile male here. So these Malaysian jungle nymphs have the distinction of laying the largest eggs of any insect we know in the world. To keep things going here at Antomica, we collect all of their eggs. So what they'll do is stick that spiky looking thing on their back end, that ovipositor, uh, into the moss or soil. And that's where they'll deposit their eggs. And they'll do this maybe three or four times a week. And so we collect as many of them as we can find. And then we'll have to wait close to a year for these eggs to hatch. So these eggs, you'll notice, look like either, um, yeah, like, like a big seed, almost like a little bean. And this, this is true of most uh, insect eggs. They're trying to take the appearance of seeds just to uh, either be in, ingested by birds, which don't usually digest them, and they'll disperse these eggs, spreading the babies, or they'll just be left alone. It won't be looked at as any kind of nutritional value if we don't recognize it as an egg. So the male here, because he's so much smaller and lighter, he does have the ability to fly. So you can see his beautiful pink wings here. We can see if we can send him for a little, a little glide here. He might not have any of it, but you can see. It's not gonna hurt him because he can break his, his fall with those wings.
All right, and there he comes. <laughs> and yeah, so they're both using different types of camouflage, right? So the girl, because she has to be a lot more motionless, uh, because she can't fly, she's camouflaging like leaves, like a guava leaf, which is what she would eat. And that's where she'll spend most of her time is just on the leaves. The male, on the other hand, because he has the wings, he's a lot more mobile. And so he's camouflaging more like tree bark. And he'll often go tree to tree in search of other females. Neither one has great eyesight, so they rely a lot on their long antennae to, uh, to feel around, to figure out where it is their, their best, next best possible move would be, and um, yeah, to seek out any possible threats. Just taking a little tour of you. <laughs> They're also known as thorny stick insects from Malaysia because of all these spikes on them uh, that would make it pretty uncomfortable if you tried to attack or eat her. And I think there, guys, you can definitely pick up the noise she's making. Uh, just kind of like a defensive noise to tell us to leave her alone, which we're now going to do. <laughs> so we'll put all these guys back. You can see this one's now moving around. A little bit anyway. She might just need a drink. And that's true. She might just be thirsty, guys. We do have a... Uh, yeah, we try and keep it as humid as here as possible. But it's not all that tropical up in northern Ontario and it takes a lot of humidifiers. So yeah, I'll pass it back to Jesse. And Jesse, you can go to uh, the classrooms and We'll try and answer some questions. Very cool. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, all no right, before problem. we go to our classrooms, I just want to note we've got six groups. I know Mr. Bernie's class, Mr. Drozny's class, several other classes are watching live on YouTube as well. So if you guys want to pass on questions in the chat bar on the right, please do do that. Uh, but while we get started, we'll start with Miss uh, Shane's class. Okay. Brianna is going to come up first. Why do praying mantis look like they're praying? Well, that's, that's a great question, guys. So I can't tell you exactly why they look like they're praying, but we can say that they've gotten their name praying mantis because of the way they look. Uh, part of it is simply that when they're praying, they're concealing those largest legs of theirs. Um, and so that's helping them camouflage a little bit better. And it also keeps all that potential energy uh, trapped inside those legs until they release them, which they would only do when there's an opportunity to catch some prey. So you can see how the other legs are much skinnier. And so it's easier for them to hide if they're concealing those front legs when they're not uh, in use. Excellent answer. All right, let's go to... Great question. Uh, what's your favorite insect that you'll have that the... Factory, whatever it's called. The factory, okay. Well, yeah, here in Antonica, uh, my favorite insect, I mean, if, if we're talking strictly insects, uh, it's probably one of these mantids. We have something called an orchid mantis, which is a much smaller mantis that camouflages like a little white flower. That would be my personal favorite. But of everything we have here, mine is probably uh, rosy, I would have to say. Do you have a favorite, uh, Jacob? Yeah, for myself, it's between the orchid mantis and the giant Asian millipede. Ooh, good one. Yeah. I guess we'll have to take a look at that one for good measure. <laughs> yeah, great question. Thank you. Well, while you're on your way, we'll go to Mrs. Roche's class. If you guys have a first question, that's the African one. Come on up. <laughs> Okay, stand right in front of the microphone right here. Okay, look there. Yeah. Ask yep, really good. Um, do the woman mantis grow one egg, or do they grow more than one egg? Ooh, good question. Uh, so they lay almost like a spider, an, an egg mass. So there's many little eggs inside. It looks like a single unit. Uh, but when it hatches, many, many little mantids will come out. 
uh, just like a, a spider's egg mass where many, many baby spiders will come out at the same time. It's a very similar strategy. Excellent. And what a beautiful uh, millipede you've got there. Oh, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Uh, let's go to Miss Olarvidi's class, which I've got to say, if you watch this video back, guys at Atomica, the kids in Miss Olarvidi's class, like, loved everything. You guys are, like, the most enthusiastic kids ever. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So your mic's muted. I don't know why. So on my screen, it says you're unmuted. But I got it. You there you go. Cool. What, what's the population for the tarantulas? Like around the, the world? Ooh, good. Uh, I couldn't really begin to give you an accurate answer. That's a really good question. If you mean like total population of all species total, I would have no idea. There are, uh, I think, several hundred types of tarantulas. Uh, and so there's new world tarantulas that are, uh, yeah, indigenous to the Americas. There's old world that are the more venomous uh, species out of Africa. So there are all types. Uh, here at Intomica, I think we have six types of tarantulas. Most of them are still babies. Uh, but yeah, very good question. I, I would have to do more research to give you a, a more accurate answer. Thank you. Thank Just as a quick follow-up to one of the questions we get from a lot of classes is if things are endangered. So is there any indication that that species has any troubles or are there lots of them all over the, the area that they live in? Which which species was that we were referring to? Or your specific tarantula species. Do you know if there's a lot of them? Are they endangered? Are they? No, the, the ones we have here um, are fairly common in wild. Uh, they're also very common as pets. So we try to focus on species that are the most docile. Because of the work we do here, we like to have things that people can handle uh, without any kind of really background training. And so we don't want the most aggressive and venomous types, which are often the most beautiful. But, um, yeah, we, we try and get some that everyone's going to love and, and not have a problem with. And, um, yeah, these happen to be more of the common types as well. Excellent. All right, let's go to Ms. Langer's class. You guys just demute your mic and uh, you'll be good to go. There you go. Should be good. Oh, so you're sorry, guys, you're demuted, but for some reason it's not coming through at all. I don't know if it's an audio thing or if your volume is not up. I can't control it, unfortunately. Worst case, if you have to type in a question, it's the little blue square at the top left of your screen. That's worst case. Okay, we'll come back in a second, see if the mic's working. In the meantime, we'll go to Ms. Eggert's class. Uh, if you guys want to demute your mic and go ahead. Looks like half your class has a question. Go for it. Go for it. Here, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Say your question. What do people that are afraid of bugs say? Could you repeat that one more time, please? It was, what do people afraid of bugs say when they come in and see you guys? Oh. Oh, you get all kinds of different reactions, uh, usually a grimace or maybe even a scream. Uh, but within no time at all, they're, they're not really scared. They're having a lot of fun and finding everything we have really friendly. Actually, that's a good question for the classes. Now you'll have to put up your hands to say this. Who is a, who was afraid of bugs, or who is afraid of bugs in the classes? Put up your hand if you're afraid of bugs. Now, are any of you less? Keep your uh, hand up. And a little less afraid of bugs now. I don't know. Hopefully, they're pretty cool. Some hands stayed up. Excellent. Minutes. All right. So in Miss Langer's class, the question was uh, right. from uh, Julian, and he wants to know why females are brown or dark and the males are colorful. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, but often we, we find the opposite. We find often that the larger females are camouflaging more like leaves. And because they are, they're often a, a really bright green. And uh, yeah, generally it's, it's the males that um, can be these, uh, these darker colors that are more camouflaged for bark or, or branches or the like. Uh, so it's a mix. It really just depends on their environment and the particular strategy they're using for camouflage. Very good question. Very good question. Uh, just as a note for the student too, so in a lot of animal groups, males are more colorful than females and it's because they want to impress the girls. Girls are more picky across the animal kingdom and so if guys are really showy, uh, like peacocks, they can- Yeah, especially birds. Yeah. 
Uh, we got a question online from Mr. Bernie's class. So Landon from Mrs. McQuaid's grade three class, I uh, would love to know how might insects help our environment? How might insects help Could you repeat? our environment? Help our environment? Yeah. Well, uh, guys, I would say that insects have, uh, you know, various roles to play in the environment. Uh, often they're as detritivores, so things that will, uh, yeah, break down waste material into good soil, uh, nutrient-rich soil that the plants will then use. So often they're towards the, the bottom of the food chain, but I, I'd say that everything in the food chain is kind of an essential part of it and keeps everything else in line as well. Uh, keeps everything balanced. Outstanding. All right, let's do another run. I will start with Mr. Shane's class. You guys have a second question? Come on. Sure. Up. Go ahead, Henry. Why is the tarantula your favorite? Why is the tarantula my favorite? Well, I would say the tarantula is my favorite um, because when I first started here, Rosie was probably the, the thing that I had the hardest time holding or wanting to hold. Uh, I was a little intimidated by her size and the potential that she had to bite me and inject venom. So for me, it was, it was the hardest thing to overcome of everything we had here. Um, but then I quickly realized how friendly she is, how docile she is, how in all of my tours with Rosie, with other people, uh, yeah, she's only ever been lovely. And so, so that's why she's my favorite. She's just got an incredible personality. And uh, yeah, she really likes meeting new people. Outstanding. Uh, good note for the classes too. So we talked about kids being afraid of bugs and, and there you are coming into this place and then being afraid initially of uh, holding her. Uh, Absolutely. If you don't get a chance to go to a place like Antomica and actually hold insects, just go look at them. Like, get close, see what they're like. You know, move Becky likes this one. It's, uh, it's outstanding. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Miss Eagle's class. If you guys have a question. What's your rarest type of insect you found? The rarest type of insect we found. Uh, so I would say that, first of all, we, we never take insects uh, out of the wild and make them our own. The reason for that is we don't want to mess with that uh, delicate balance in the natural ecosystem, in the food chain. So the insects that we get typically come from other science centers um, or people who rear insects at home. Um, and because they're rearing them at home, it's, it's often that they're not very rare. Uh, people don't want to deal with things that are endangered. Um, they just want to protect them, but there doesn't want to be any, um, yeah, any risk of, again, making something endangered or, or upsetting the balance that they have in nature. So most of what we have are, are fairly common species, I would have to say. Okay. Uh, question good question. Langer. Yeah, very good question. Sorry. Uh, so Ms. Langer's class, a student wanted to ask, how many insects do you have total at the facility? Ooh, how many insects do we have total? We always get this question, guys. It's a great question. The number is always changing, and so we, uh, we rarely have the right answer to this. We can give you a quick estimate, though, Yeah. and I would say somewhere around 30 different species, uh, the total number of which is, is in the many, many hundreds, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Because there are a few colonies, especially our phasmids, our stick bugs, that have... 30 to 50 per per species so with even just 10 five or 10 species of those alone that's a, a couple hundred and then the rest you just tack on top of that so yeah I'd, definitely a few hundred here yeah and probably around 30 species and that's probably at the upper end of, of what we've ever had uh we have a whole lot of stuff right now people have been really generous lately very cool I am when all those eggs hatch, you'll have that many more. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Bernie's class again. So Lucas uh, wants to ask how the large African snail made its way to Florida. So uh, what we've been told, guys, and this is like secondhand information, but uh, the story goes that, um, yeah, someone visiting Africa pocketed some snails and took them home to make as personal pets in Florida and perhaps not realizing how much they would eat and how quickly they would multiply, and especially how long they would live, 
uh, these pets became unwanted pets and they were released into the wild. And so we don't really advise, um, you know, killing insects. It, it might have been a lot better if someone had, uh, yeah, left these snails in Africa rather than take them back to America and introduce them into the wild where they had no natural predators to keep their population in check. Uh, because now their population is kind of out of control. And so now it's at the point where people have considered importing other non-native species to help control these numbers. So we've seen this a number of times uh, with a number of different insects that are not native to the Americas that have been brought here, either by accident or intentionally. Uh, and then other measures such as, they'll, they'll call it biocontrol, so the use of another species to help control uh, a species lower in the food chain, it doesn't always work. Sometimes uh, that new species can also cause problems and might not have any predators to keep it, its numbers in control. And sometimes uh, this is even more of a problem than the initial one. But yeah, that's the story is that initially they were taken as pets from, uh, from Africa and released into the wild, supposedly intentionally. They're not good. Uh, all right, we will wrap it up with three more questions. So we'll go to Ms. Eggert's class first. If you guys want to come and demute your mic, go right ahead. Hi. How much, how much insects have you found? How much insects? Well, how much ins well, ins found? Uh, again, so... Most of the insects that, that we come to us, uh, but yeah, we have summer camps. We have school groups here all the time, and we'll go out into the wild with our nets to see what we can find in our na natural environment to identify them. We always release them afterwards, uh, but we've found upwards of 40 different types of insects just around here. And one of our classes unfortunately had to leave, so we'll go to Ms. Roush's class to wrap us up. Do you guys have a last question? Come on up. We're just in the middle of a hangout. I'll call you right back. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, busy. No worries. Yeah, no, no, they're good. They're they're telling their uh, their PA system. You can go. <laughs> go ahead, guys. And what's your question? Go ahead. Uh, does that snail have zebra muscles? Does the snail have zebra muscles? That was the question. Okay, so uh, the giant African land snail lives on land, and the zebra mussel has, has a shell, but uh, it lives in the water. And they both come from very different areas of the world and fill different uh, roles in the food chain. So the zebra mussel um, acts almost like a filter for aquatic systems. So it'll help uh, clean and purify the water. But um, yeah, here here they're invasive and they've uh, somewhat become a problem. But that's their you know normal role in the environment. Uh, and yeah, the snail is not an aquatic species and helps to make great soil. But it's not a a water purifier in the way the uh, the zebra mussel is, but they are both invasive species. So, great question. All right, uh, you know what? That was a really quick answer. So we've got time for one more. So Miss Langer's class asked, "Do all insects have the same bone structure, so to speak?" Uh, the same bone structure, so to speak. Well, regarding bone structure, I, I I guess I would say that they all have exoskeletons yes. um, and the insects all have similar body parts. So they all have six legs, two antennae, and generally speaking, two different sets of wings. Uh, and so those are the commonalities between insects across different species. So, but there are always some exceptions. There are always exceptions to the rule. That's right. This and guy being one of them. <laughs> for the really younger class, and that's beautiful, Millipede, my. Um, for the younger classes, exoskeletons, can you explain a little bit about what that means really quickly? Oh, sure. Great, great question, Jesse. Sorry for not explaining that, guys. So exoskeleton, unlike our skeletons, 
which are internal to our bodies. They're inside. Um, the insect's bone system, their exoskeleton, is uh, a skeletal system on the outside of them, themselves. So that's often why you'll find they're very hard on the outside. It's because these are their bones. All their um, internal organs are protected by this outside shell, this exoskeleton. Very cool. Uh, and Michael, last but not least, before we wrap up, uh, is there anything else, one last message you want to say to all our classes about insects, where they can go find them, how much they should appreciate them, anything else? Yeah, we, well, we hope you guys learned something about the insect world today, that it makes you a little more comfortable to go and, and find uh, what's available in your own native environments as far as insects are concerned. Well, we've been holding, uh, you know, tarantulas and praying mantids and different things here today. We don't recommend doing that with wild species. We only do that because we've had them so long, because they've been handled so long that we know their personalities uh, and we know they're not going to pose any threat to us. But that doesn't mean you can't go out in nature and observe and learn more about what's all around us. So we, uh, we invite you guys to do that. Excellent. All right. At the end of every hangout, what we do is demute everyone's mics. So you guys can join me in saying a big thank you. So Miss Eagle's class, Miss Rouch's class, Miss Langer's class, and Miss Eggert's class. If you can join me, say thank you so much to Michael and Jacob. Thank you, guys. Bye. Awesome. Uh, for the classes, we look forward to having you back for more hangouts soon. Michael and Atomica, guys, thanks so much. That was marvelous as always. And, uh, Thank you so much for sharing your wide world of insects with us. You're very welcome, guys. Thanks for...